eight. Lots of yams, please. I'm not on a diet. Early in the game, waiting restlessly for my jungle to overgrow the window, I reactivated one of my childhood rainy day standbys, sprouting sweet potato vines. In the process, I discovered modern science had struck again since I was a boy. More and more sweet potatoes and yams are now sprayed with a growth inhibitor to prevent unseemly sprigs from making their appearance on crops left unpicked along the grocer's shelves. Needless to say, this treatment also discourages them from growing in the garden when wanted. Like most female inhabitants of North America, Susan is a sometimes diet watcher. So when in a retrogressive fit of boyish glee, I went out and bought several pounds each of yams and sweet potatoes, she retreated behind her calorie counter, emitting ominous rumbles, which I think did not originate in an empty stomach. Of course, since a whole yam or potato is used for the garden, one doesn't have to eat it at all. But one can't plant a whole peck of potatoes in one window. Throwing in the towel, Susan served candied yams for a week running. That, she maintained, ought to take care of my sweet tooth for the next year. By the end of the week and the third bag of potatoes, I was fully satisfied that at least one of the lot was free of growth inhabitants. I had an uneasy sensation that I might sprout little candied yam sprigs if I ate any more. Not only are many potatoes sprayed with growth inhibitors, inhibitors they are dyed as well. This I discovered when I went to wash those saved for planting. I found myself deluged in orange-red dye. Susan assured me that they were not synthetic yams. I wasn't completely convinced, though I had to admit such a radical improvement as a plastic potato did seem a bit premature even for the most progressive American consumer specialists. I sank my yam and my sweet potato sans dye in wide mouthed applesauce jars partly filled with water, not without misgiving, misgivings about the appropriateness of fruit jars for root crops. They worked fine. A week after the partial immersion, small green shoots began to appear. They were a big encouragement during the long wait for some of the slower jungle seeds to germinate. For instance, my date pits had been molding for nigh on six months, but later for that. Once the main shoots were about eight inches high, I transplanted the potatoes to pots. I learned the hard way to bury them completely in soil, even if some of the vines sprouting very every which way out of the tubers have to be covered with loose soil. Leaving a tuber exposed will produce an excellent serial documentary on rotten potato, not to mention the hordes of small invaders likely to drop by. Actually, the tubers can be buried before they sprout at all. It will merely take longer to see results, which, when you're not sure whether or not you have an inhibited yam, could pose a problem. There is a school of thought that contrary thinking is generally the most productive. In the case of the after-dinner garden, this proves true quite frequently. Probably the best example of all is the sweet potato or yam. In their natural habitat, their preference is for light, loose soil in the line of a sandy loam 
that isn't too rich. Under this sort of roof, the two birds produced will be golden, delicious, and many. On the other hand, if the soil is heavier and relatively speaking overly rich, the yam and sweet potato will produce a poor underground crop, concentrating more on putting out a lush green growth. With the going price of 29 cents a pound for yams in a neighborhood, I was much more interested in growing the vines than harvesting the crop. So I used a rich potting mixture, half humus, half potting soil, with just a couple of small handfuls of sand for good measure. The pots for yam or sweet potato vines should be deep, at least 50% deeper than the lengths of the tubers themselves. Like all quick growing plants, they favor a liberal amount of water. Mine lap up a drink three times a week or more, and if they are kept in a sunny spot, overwatering shouldn't be much of a problem. While happiest with a sunny ledge to bake on, the plants will grow well enough on an hour or so of sunshine a day. Given fairly sunny conditions, the vines on reaching, mat vines on reaching maturity will quite often flower indoors. This is particularly true of yams, which blossom out in greenish bell-shaped flowers, individually quite small, but growing in long trailing clusters that droop down gracefully among the leaves. Although the terms sweet potato and yam have become colloquially interchangeable, the plants are two quite distinct, two quite distinct species. To my surprise, I found out the sweet potato is the real tropical one. The yam family is much bigger and more far flung. Somehow I had expected just the opposite. The yam belongs to the genus Dioscoria, which includes among its more hermit-like members one called Dioscoria pyrenaica, indigenous only to Europe, more specifically to Pyrenees. There it grows unmolested and uneaten, thousands of miles from any of its relatives, or as they say in the trade, congen congeners. The genus also includes Dioscoria Goria alata, which produces a tuba weighing up to a hundred pounds. An excellent gourmet gift for the elephant who has everything. The species more often found in a supermarket, possibly to avoid collapsed shopping carts, is the Dioscoria bulbifera, or the air potato yams. Although widely cultivated from a city marketing point of view, it seems to have a shyness reminiscent, reminiscent of its recluse Pyrenees cousin, usually limiting its appearance to the holiday season. By the way, there's always the outside chance that a small stray Dioscoria alata has made its way into the batch you buy, so if your, pot, if your pots seem to be bulging at the seams, check the building plans of your apartment for where the structural supports are located, as you might end up with several hundred pounds of yam slumped over your windowsill.